The examination of the shoulder aims to determine the causation of pain and dysfunction in the shoulder complex. The examination usually begins with observation and is followed by active, passive and resistive movements which will further direct the palpation and special orthopaedic tests to confirm or rule out a suspected pathology. I'm now going to go through a shoulder examination. Initial observations from the anterior include direct inspection of the bony and soft tissue contours around the shoulder complex as well as the head and cervical position and upper limb to observe for any abnormalities. I look for bilateral comparisons to include hypertrophy, atrophy, discoloration, swelling, surgical scars, as well as any other structural differences, such as the step deformity to the acromioclavicular joint. The view from the side allows you to assess the spinal postures of cervical lordosis and thoracic kyphosis. You can also see the contributing factors to scapulothoracic protraction or retraction. From the back, we can again look at the contours and body alignment, this time including signs of scoliosis. Noting areas of atrophy which may indicate a nerve palsy, such as sometimes seen in trapezius atrophy due to spinal accessory nerve palsy. It is important to look at the scapular position, including height, rotation and winging. I usually briefly observe again in standing to see if there are any different findings from a seated position and to get an understanding of overall body alignment and position before going on to a kinetic chain screen and standing. This screen can vary depending on the sport but usually involves a single leg squat. I observe for sagittal plane alignment and neuromuscular control of the lower limb and I also look at lumbar pelvic and torso control through the squat. This is often enough to get an indication where the reduced core function may be contributing to overload of the shoulder. If the subjective or early objective findings suggest a potential referral from the cervical region, then I complete a simple clearing screen. This screen includes a range of cervical movements, as well as Sperling's foramenal compression test. This test is designed to provoke or replicate any nerve root symptoms that may be causing pain in the neck and shoulder. Active movements allow the practitioner to assess active range, control, muscle function and patient willingness to complete the movements available at the shoulder complex. Starting off with flexion and extension, I then continue with gross movements of abduction and adduction. These coronal plane movements should be monitored carefully for the presence of scapular dyskinesia. Understanding of force couples acting upon the shoulder is especially important when looking at the scapular humeral rhythm. We are looking for a smooth movement through the full range with a roughly 2 to 1 ratio of movement of the humerus to the scapula. There are a number of ways to assess rotation of the glenohumeral joint. After assessing in a resting and abducted positions, I test for glenohumeral internal rotation deficit or GERD with the athlete up against the wall. With shoulder blades maintaining contact with the wall and elbows maintaining their position, the athlete moves actively into internal rotation. If the affected limb is unable to drop down and rotate internally within 25 degrees of the unaffected limb, then it can be classified as having a GERD defect. Don't let your shoulder blades come off the back of the wall. Combined movements of hand behind head and hand behind back test a combination of flexion, abduction and external rotation, as well as extension, adduction and internal rotation respectively. The end position of each movement can be measured for bilateral comparison. The final active movements of horizontal flexion and extension can be tested before we move on to shoulder girdle movements. The shoulder girdle movements of elevation, depression, protraction and retraction take the sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular joints and scapulothoracic articulation through their available range. Again as we do this we're looking for the quality and range of motion. These movements are then repeated in a passive physiological manner, with the patient in a relaxed position of supine or side lying. With the right patient positioning, 
just to one side of the treatment table. We can take the glenohumeral joint through all planes of available movement. These passive movements should have a slightly greater range than active movements as we test the anatomical barriers and any restrictions should be noted with bilateral comparison. I'm again looking for quality of movement through the range and for the normality of end fields of tissue stretch or soft tissue approximation. With the patient then in a the sideline and relaxed position, I move on to test the passive movements of the scapulothoracic articulation. Again, feeling for the smooth quality of motion around the area and looking for any restrictions which may be causing localised dysfunction or limiting glenohumeral range. Passive movements of the shoulder girdle. So taking hold of the scapula. We then go through a range of resisted muscle testing for the shoulder complex. Resisted muscle testing compares the strength of the muscles or muscle groups in a neutral position. Weakness may occur as a result of shoulder injury or be apparent as a predisposing factor. If pathology to muscular tenderness structure or the osseous insertion is apparent, then pain and or weakness will be present. Some compression of the inert tissues may occur, but should be kept minimal in an isometric contraction. If the initial position causes pain, other positions may be tried to further differentiate the specific contractile tissue that has been injured. Resisted scrapular control can be tested using a modified press-up. Pressure can be applied to further resist the protraction and retraction movements while we monitor the scapular stabilisation. Systematic palpation is directed by previous findings and needs sound anatomical knowledge to be accurate and effective. Palpation looks for areas of maximal focal tenderness. It can help differentiate between local structures. Soft tissue properties of resistance, muscle spasm and tenderness should also be assessed. And one more press up. Okay, and back, stand back up for me. Starting anterior immediately at the sternoclavicular joint, I then work my way laterally and systematically around the anterior and lateral shoulder before working my way towards the posterior aspect. Working through the anterior musculature of pectoralis major or minor, we're then working out laterally to have a feel for the tenderness insertions of the pecs and of the latissimus dorsi. Then working our way laterally to feel the muscle bulk of the biceps and up towards the biceps tendon sitting in the bicepital groove. Laterally we can feel the musculature of the deltoid and down towards the deltoid tuberosity before moving so posteriorly. The posterior aspect we can feel across the spine of the scapula, come down the medial border of the scapula and find the inferior angle, work our way up laterally. When we felt the musculature around this area we can palpate the paraspinal musculature from the upper fibres of the trapezius up to the base of the occiput. 
and we'll follow it back down the upper traps. And we have to look and feel for any atrophy and any comparison to one side compared to the other. Now moving on to special orthopaedic tests, I'm firstly looking at the impingement with the empty and full can tests. This aims to detect for the presence of supraspinatus tendinopathy, a partial or complete tear, or a neurogenic weakness of the supraspinatus. Reproduction of the patient's pain without weakness is suggestive of supraspinatus impingement or tendinopathy, while painful weakness may indicate a partial or complete tear. Weakness without any pain may result from a C5 palsy or suprascapular neuropathy. The Hawkins-Kennedy test is used to identify subacromial or internal impingement. The glenohumeral joint is passively taken into internal rotation, thereby rotating the greater tuberosity under the coracoacromial arch. Pain is reproduced increasingly towards the end of rotation movement and indicates rotator cuff pathology involving the cuff itself, the adjacent bursa or the long head of biceps. Internal rotation and flexion otherwise known as NIRS test, identifies symptomatic subacromial impingement involving the rotator cuff, subacromial bursa, or long head of biceps. Okay, Good. Abduction with inferior distraction, as well as the sulcus sign tests and speeds tests, can all give an indication of a slap lesion or slap pathology to the glenoid labrum. Now we're going to have a look at sulcus sign. Anterior and posterior jaw tests or joint play can give a good indication of anterior and posterior instability or increased laxity in the glenohumeral joint. If we're suspecting anterior laxity, we can use the apprehension and relocation test. If the patient registers apprehension during the manoeuvre or resist attempts to move the shoulder further, then posterior force is applied to the humeral head and rotation is repeated. If the feeling of apprehension is lessens and the degree of external rotation available increases before the apprehension is provoked, the test is positive. Lastly, we can look at neurodynamic upper limb tension tests. These check for mechanical movement of neurological tissues and their sensitivity to mechanical stress and compression. Depending on the arm position, we can target different neural structures. This first one is biasing the median nerve, with lateral neck flexion used to sensitize and desensitize the neural structures. The second one is biasing the radial nerve, with the thumb tucked in and internal rotation of the forearm. Now, there, until your right, until your right shoulder, and the other way around there. 